is the time. Uh, this afternoon, uh, our first speaker is uh, uh, Arthur Lander. Uh, he from UCL Irvine. Uh, actually, he's a, a Donald Brand Professor in de Developmental and Cell Biology in the School of Biological Science. Actually, he has done lots of interdisciplinary work between mathematics and biology. So let's welcome the first speaker. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, let me turn this on. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, invitation to come here. Uh, Hong Kong is such a wonderful place. And uh, it's always great uh, to talk to an audience at the interface between biology and mathematics. You know, mathematics is known for its sort of extreme beauty, and uh, biology is known for its extreme messiness, right? So, <laughs> so I, really, I really like occupying that space in between, you know. But, but truthfully, you know, it really is a, a, a characteristic of biology that is composed of very sloppy parts, and it lives in a very messy, unpredictable world. Um, you know, the levels of intracellular components have massive stochastic fluctuations. Biochemical reactions are probabilistic. The waiting times are exponentially distributed. Temporal fluctuations compound. And all the external parameters are unreliable and unpredictable, things like temperature, or mechanical forces, and so on. And this peculiarity of biology you know, that, that uh, it operates in such a messy uh, uh, way um, and yet comes out extremely reliable is something that's puzzled scientists for a very long time. In fact, this was really the motivation behind uh, Schrodinger, who back in the 40s wrote his famous book, What is Life? You know, he was very puzzled by the sort of reliability of the genome and the fact that it could survive for so many millennia without change when really nothing he knew of in the physical world could do likewise. And so in Schrodinger's view, he was ready to uh, find new physics in biology to explain this. But of course, we now know there is no new physics in biology. At least no one's found any new physics in biology. But what we have found is a lot of engineering, and particularly control engineering, that is just simply spectacularly successful. And uh, control, achieving reliability in a messy world, is something that uh, you know, people who study control in mathematics and engineering uh, you know, have, have learned a lot about in the last uh, 50 years or so. And we know that basically systems that are controlled can be divided into two categories. Those are, are open loop control systems where there are disturbances, but somehow the system's configured so the disturbances cancel themselves out. You know, they, the things drop out, and that's sort of a feed-forward control. Or you can have control in which the system is monitoring its own performance, which means it has to know what its own performance is supposed to be, and then using that to adjust the output so you achieve the right performance, and that's feedback control. And of course, engineers know that of these two ways of controlling systems, the only one that can work in a truly unpredictable world is feedback control, right? That if you don't know what the disturbances are, you can't configure the system so that it always cancels them out. So you have to have some way of measuring performance and feeding it back. So I personally believe that the area of developmental biology is absolutely the best place to study this issue of control in biology because you have very messy variable beginnings, uh, variable numbers of cells, cells dying, doing all kinds of crazy, unpredictable things, and nevertheless, you have extremely reliable endings, right? If you look at these pictures of monozygotic twins here, right, you see what we all know. You also can look at the two halves of your body externally, and you'll see that same amazing reliability of pattern that is the relative positions of the elements of the body relative to each other, and reliability of scale, the sizes of things, right, are highly reproducible and yet encoded by the genome, right? So this, in many ways, is the ultimate 4D genome problem, but it's not the 4D of the genome, it's the 4D of the organism that's somehow being encoded in the genome. And so the question that occupies a lot of my attention is, you know, what are the mechanisms 
that account for this extreme control. So development, of course, is an example of self-organization. Right? We, we, there are a lot of self-organizing systems, and we know that with only a few exceptions, neither pattern nor scale are actually represented in the fertilized egg. Of course, in the Middle Ages, that's not what people thought. <laughs> they thought that in the sperm there was a little man called the homunculus, and all the pattern was there, and it simply needed to sort of fulfill itself and grow. But now we pretty much know that no pattern has to emerge on its own, and scale has to emerge on its own. And Furthermore, one more thing is that pattern and scale are clearly coordinated with each other. And so we know, for example, if you starve flies during their development, you get small flies, which are perfectly patterned for a different size, right? Everything is located in a slightly different place, but everything's been scaled proportionally. And similarly, genetic differences in people produce people that are all proportionally more or less the same and yet can be extremely different in size. And so then that becomes now a constraint on the self-organizing schemes that are responsible for pattern and size, that they have to somehow be coupled to each other. And you can imagine two ways of coupling them. One is where size dictates pattern. And so, for example, we know from Hans Driesch's work back in the 1890s that if you take a sea urchin larva at the two cell stage and split the two cells into separate cells, each one makes a perfectly patterned larva at half the size. Okay, so the pattern gets scaled down automatically when the size ends up being scaled down. So size seems to dictate pattern. But we also know in other cases, so we can take two mouse embryos and mash them together to make one double-sized mouse embryo and put that back into a mouse and you do not get a double-sized mouse out at the end. You get a normal-sized mouse with the normal number of cells. So the process of patterning all these tissues then adjusts the size so everything's correct. So here it seems that pattern dictates size. And so the, the question is, what are the mechanisms, and when is size dictating pattern? When is pattern dictating size? How is all this working out? So in my talk today, I'm going to talk about two sort of separate examples, one of this sort of thing and one of that sort of thing, and then we'll try to see if we can put them together. Just a question about the top yeah. one. How far down does this continue? What, what do you mean? Will, will those... Do I do it the fourth state? Do I get something that's a part of the size? And how far can I get Yeah, I think you can go to about four. And after that, yeah, then the cells stop being totipotent sufficiently to give you four good embryos. Yeah, good question. So I'm going to start by talking about this case, the issue of how can size regulate pattern. And actually, a, a suggested explanation for that goes back to a rather famous paper from 1969 by Lewis Wolpert, who interestingly was an engineer by training. Most biologists credit Wolpert with the idea of positional information. This is the idea that uh, if you have something that's produced in one part of the organism, and if it can make a gradient, like a diffusion gradient, that essentially that creates a one-to-one -one mapping of the concentration of this substance. He stole the word morphogen from uh, Alan Turing. Uh, and it creates a one-to-one -one mapping of concentration to what you might call positional value. And so then if gene expression is simply sensitive to that positional value, you can have all kinds of patterns of gene expression that are simply reading out this map. So it doesn't really create pattern. It just it kind of bumps it down to the next level. It gives you a way to let the genome do the work right? without the genome having to have any spatial information. That's all encoded in this gradient. So actually, Wolpert didn't invent this idea. It had been kicking around for a few decades. Um, but what he did point out in this paper is a mechanism to make it scale. And he pointed out that if that gradient is created by diffusion from a source to a sink, such that different gene expression changes occur when the gradient crosses particular thresholds, that as you move the sink farther away, that is, you make the field bigger, these thresholds move their positions proportionately. And consequently, anything patterned by these thresholds would pattern proportionally. Okay, and that idea of the source sink gradient, of course, is grounded in the physics of diffusion. We know from fixed second law, right, that if you have a, 
morphogen produced at a boundary and it's just transported uniformly and randomly and is absorbed at another boundary, you should get a straight line. And the values of this, the shape of the straight line should be determined by the boundary conditions. So for simplicity, uh, Wolper just assumed that the boundary condition was a fixed value of the morphogen. But that was a little bit unbiological because of course the genome doesn't specify the concentrations of molecules. The genome specifies the rate at which you produce gene products, right? The rate. So really the better way to represent this um, is to have a region that produces something at a fixed concentration. But then if you model that, if you do the math on that, you see in fact it doesn't scale. What happens as you move the boundary out is the initial conditions actually starts rising and rising and rising. Okay, and that's a consequence of Fick's first law, right, which is that the flux is proportional to the slope. So as you're changing the slope, right, you better have a higher concentration locally to, to compensate for the lower flux out. Okay, now it turns out you can kind of mitigate that problem if you put a whole bunch of something in here that eats up the morphogen and acts as kind of a buffer. So it's not a killer problem for Wolpert, but it turns out there's another killer problem, which is by the 1990s, people were able to actually view morphogen gradients, for example, by fusing the morphogens to fluorescent proteins, as you see here. And you can see that doesn't look like a straight line. In fact, one of the best characterized morphogens is this molecule bicoid in a fruit fly embryo here. And not only isn't it a straight line, but on a log plot, it's a straight line, meaning it's a declining exponential. And that also turns out to follow from fixed laws, that if you have something produced at a fixed boundary and it's transported, but also taken up and destroyed while it's being transported, and if it's being destroyed at a constant probability everywhere, then in fact, this doesn't solve to a line, it solves to a declining exponential. And the decay constant of that declining exponential is essentially the square root of the ratio of the diffusivity, how fast the thing diffuses, and the rate of uptake. And that, that uh, gives us a, a term we call the decay length, or the characteristic decay length. Okay, so for anything that diffuses, if you know the diffusivity and the rate at which it's taken up, you can calculate the shape of the exponential that's produced. But of course, if you now see what happens as you move the boundary out on that, um, oops, let me just back that up again, sorry. As you move the boundary, what you see is it doesn't scale at all, right? At the very, very beginning, when it's smaller than its own decay length, it's sort of scaling and then it basically gets stuck. Okay, so basically in the presence of uniform decay, scaling falls as soon as the morphogen field exceeds its own characteristic decay length. All right, and of course we now know pretty much all morphogens are subject to decay in their own fields because they bind receptors and receptors take them up and that destroys them. So this is a big problem for the sort of Wolpert um, model. Interestingly though, if you actually look at morphogen gradients, which again we can now do, they do scale, right? So one of the classic morphogen gradients that's uh, studied in many labs is the one that establishes this pattern in the insect wing of these four veins. And that's done during a, a stage uh, in the larva when there's just a, a pouch with a sheet of cells. These columnar cells here, these are gonna become the wing. And that sheet's already been patterned during embryogenesis to create an anterior and a posterior half. And the posterior half makes a morphogen called hedgehog. So that corresponds to this part of the wing. And then hedgehog, that boundary between hedgehog and no hedgehog patterns one of the veins. And then hedgehog diffuses out and where it gets to a certain threshold patterns another vein. But it also turns on the production of another morphogen called DPP which is a member of the BMP family. And it now diffuses out in both directions, and it's what creates this morphogen gradient that's been visualized with uh, GFP. Um, and it can also be visualized by staining for the initial phosphorylation product of its receptor, which is called phosphomad. So if I say phosphomad or PMAD, I'm referring to what's downstream of this DPP morphogen. And you can see it's a gradient that goes out bi-directionally 
from a source here. This is sort of looking down on this disk. And basically at two different points in this gradient and that gradient, you generate the L2 and L5 veins. So that's how the DPP gradient works. And so if you use that phosphomad or DPP itself when it's fluorescently tagged to follow the gradient as the disk develops during larval life, what you see is it scales. And the, si the decay length of that exponential keeps rising as the tissue size keeps rising. Now this just says that there's a coupling between the decay length and the tissue size. This is a slightly better experiment because you actually force the tissue to grow bigger or get smaller in one domain, the posterior domain, and you show that the DPP gradient moves in or out with it. Okay, so you can force the morphogen gradient to change by making a change in the tissue size. So this was a puzzle for a very long time. How, how could it be that these gradients are changing their size if you know, moving a boundary isn't supposed to have any effect on them? Um, and then in around 2010, a physicist in Israel, Nama Barkai, uh, proposed a model uh, called the expander repressor model. And it's a, it's a mathematical model. It's based on the same concept that you have morphogen produced at a boundary, transported, taken up. But it now adds one more thing, which is that the morphogen signaling represses the expression of an expander molecule. Expander molecule being something that itself diffuses back into the gradient and adjusts either morphogen transport or morphogen uptake. So the idea is that in order to scale the gradient, you have to change the decay length. The decay length is the ratio of diffusivity to uptake. Something's got to change that ratio throughout the gradient. And it turns out if you have the morphogen repress something so that it's only made at the boundary, when you move the boundary far away, then there's less of it. When there's less of it, right, then the gradient shrinks back. And so you end up coupling the gradient to the boundary. Okay. And it, by chance, a year after this model, this is one of these cases where the math precedes the biology by about a year. A year after the model, a molecule comes along called Pentagon, which is a peculiar name, but it refers to the fact that in the adult fly, the fifth vein is gone. So it's Pentagon. Anyway, um, it's a secreted molecule. Its expression is repressed by the morphogen. So remember, the morphogen is made in the middle of the disk, and it's only made on the edges because the morphogen is repressing it. So it's only made far from the morphogen. And when you take it away, that morphogen gradient, remember PMAD marks the gradient going out bidirectionally, shrinks tremendously. So this is clearly an expander that's repressed by DPP. And sure enough, if you make mutants for this expander, you get gradients that don't scale. So these gradients are plotted on a log scale, which means when they're exponential, they should look like a line. And then here they're plotted in relative coordinates. Here they're plotted in absolute coordinates. So normally the thing moves out with time. And on relative coordinates, it stays constant. In a pentagon mutant, it stays constant in absolute coordinates and therefore is constantly shrinking in relative coordinates. Okay, so that all sounds like one of these great cases where a beautiful model fits the biology, all done, except for one ugly little fact, which is Pentagon completely violates one of the critical assumptions of the model, which is that the expander has to itself have an extremely long decay length. It has to be able to spread throughout the entire gradient. Right? The idea being that it has to regulate that decay length of the gradient everywhere. Actually, we already knew that that wasn't likely to be the case from these early experiments, 10 years earlier, in which part of the disk had been forced to grow big or forced to shrink small, and the DPP gradient moved with it, because those experiments were done where only half the disk was made to grow big or shrink small, and only that half of the DPP gradient expanded with it. And if all that was being done by some molecule that was diffusing everywhere, it should have affected both halves, right? It shouldn't have been restricted to just one half. So actually to, to prove that that's really the case, uh, Jimmy Ju in my lab um, did some experiments in which he used uh, RNA, siRNA knockdown to knock down pent just in one half of the disk. Okay, so we're taking it away just on the posterior side 
Okay, and what we see is if we take pent away everywhere, the DPP gradient shrinks everywhere. But if we take pent away just in the posterior, the DPP gradient shrinks just in the posterior. So pent is only having an effect on the side of the disc it's on, and therefore it can't be spreading everywhere. In fact, if you fuse GFP to it, you can see it barely diffuses eight or nine microns away from the place that it's produced. And if you make little clones, this is a trick people do in fruit flies, they make little clones of cells that overexpress or underexpress things. So you make little clones here that make way too much pent, and they have effects that actually lower the amount of DPP signaling, but they do it very locally, not spread far from where the clone is. So again, it tells you whatever it's doing, it's doing it quite short range. In fact, one of the other things you can notice it's doing when you make these little clones, is if you stain for a molecule called DLP, you can see that that molecule begins to go away everywhere these clones are, except right here in the middle, where it's regulated differently. But in most places, the DLP vanishes um, when you overexpress pent. And again, it's very, very local, so it's acting at short distance. So it turns out it also does this to a related molecule called DALI. So DALI and DALI-like, or DLP, are, um, are related proteins. They're what are called cell surface heparin sulfate proteoglycans. It's a mouthful, but basically these are uh, cell surface proteins that carry this type of carbohydrate chain. And using that carbohydrate chain, they act as co-receptors to help form the complex of the morphogen with its receptor. So they basically act as kind of accessory proteins to help get the morphogen onto its receptor thereby promoting not only the signaling through the morphogen, but also promoting the uptake of the morphogen by its receptor. So PENT removes these things, all right? So is that why it has this scaling phenotype, this shrunk gradient phenotype? So you would think, well, all you have to do is knock out DALI and DLP, and then you should just see, does that, is that the same as, let's see, that would have to be the same as too much pent, right? But you can't really do that experiment because if you knock it out, it's expressed in a lot of places and it's involved in the receptor's signaling. And so the morphogen gradient itself will be all messed up. So you can't really do that experiment. What you have to do is something a bit more subtle. If we think pent is only acting over here, then we only have to knock these things out over there, which is something we can do in fruit flies by using siRNA. We can knock down these molecules just in the lateral margins of this morphogen gradient, and then um, we should phenocopy overexpression of PENT. And rather than have to knock both of them down, we can knock them down together by simply knocking down the enzymes that make this heparin sulfate chain. So that's actually what's shown here, is when you see these gradients, this is a control, and this is knocking down those enzymes, and this is actually adding PENT and then this is knocking down those enzymes globally. You can see how it totally messes up the gradient. That's why you don't want to do this experiment. You want to do these. But obviously, these are just one picture of one disk, and you can't really tell much from them. What you have to do is you have to do a few hundred of them, right? And then collect all the data and then spread them out. And actually, you see a very interesting thing, which is, first of all, as disks get bigger, the decay length rises. That's that scaling phenomenon that I pointed out before. But actually, you notice that as disks go beyond about this size, the scaling slows down or stops. So scaling is not one thing. It's actually two different processes, one that happens early and then something very subtle that's happening late. But the important thing you can see is knocking down the, this enzyme comes close to phenocopying the overexpression of PENT. It basically, it says, yes, indeed, simply by taking this stuff away in the lateral margins of the disk, right, you're able to spread the gradient. That's a very surprising thing, right? Because the gradient is formed by this uptake everywhere, but all I've done is change stuff in the edges, and now the whole gradient changed, right? So how is it possible to have action at a distance like that on a morphogen gradient? So, to understand that, you have to recognize that the, the model that we've been talking about assumes for convenience that uptake is uniform, linear, everywhere. But in fact, that's not true. We know that the receptors are themselves repressed by the morphogen. And DALI is itself repressed by the morphogen. So in fact, all the things doing the uptake 
are being repressed by the thing that they're taking up. Okay, so there's a big feedback loop there. Now, what does that feedback mean? Not a lot from the standpoint of the general shape of the morphogen gradient. So this just shows you if you had uniform uptake or uptake that was kind of skewed to be heavily at the far end and almost none at the near end, it hardly changes the shape of the gradient at all, right? There's some changes far out here. Turns out in the DPP gradient, no one can ever measure what's out here. So in terms of what you can measure, it's barely detectable. But it turns out now there's a very important difference among these gradients that all look alike. And that's that, that apparent decay length, in other words, where this gradient falls to 1 over E of its starting value, now becomes disconnected from this square root of D over K. It's no longer equal to that. It turns out that in this part of the gradient, the square root of D over K is very large, much bigger than the gradient itself. And over here, it's very small. And so what the consequence of that is, is it means that the location, if the location where this thing rises is moved, the whole gradient will move because most of the work of degrading is happening here. Hardly any of it's happening there. And so you would predict that as you move this over, you would move the whole gradient with it. That essentially you could scale a gradient by pulling the edge, in fact, that's exactly Wolpert's model. But the difference between this and Wolpert's model is Wolpert's model has a sink, and this has no sink, right? This generates its own sink, in effect, by negative feedback on the things that are upregulating the mor that, that are degrading the morphogen. In fact, to actually get that to work as a proper model, to, you know, to put it all together, you have to, um, you have to uh, model both the morphogen gradient formation and the growth together which for many years no one did because they assumed morphogens diffuse fast, so you could treat them as quasi-steady state. But in fact, the morphogens may diffuse fast, but all the things downstream like uptake and signaling are actually quite slow. So you can't ignore them. You have to model them together. And what you can see, depending on whether you're looking at DPP or target genes, right, is you can see these gradients change over time. It's actually a little more helpful to see them in a scaled frame so this is always scaled to the size of the field. And you can see it's not perfect, but if you look at it in terms of the apparent decay length rising as the tissue gets bigger, right, you would predict that particularly when you're looking at target genes and things like uh, the signaling, there's a period until the disk gets to about 50 microns when the relative decay length is constant. So that would be perfect scaling, and then it falls apart. Remember, it's exactly what we saw. Everything scaled for about 50 microns and then started to fall apart. And you would predict if you took away that feedback on receptors and co-receptors, that wouldn't happen, right? Things would fall apart much, much sooner. And so we can actually do that experiment. We can replace the endogenous receptor with an unregulated receptor transgene, and we can replace the endogenous DALI with an unre unregulated ubiquitously expressed DALI we weren't able to do DALI-like or DLP, but that turns out to be uniformly expressed. So we get most of the work done with these two. And, oh, gosh, why did that? I have to take that away. Oh, sorry. I'm going to, for some reason. Let's make that disappear. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so then you've got a lot of points. But basically, the idea is here's what you see in a wild type set of disks. You take away, you make DALI uniform, you make thick veins uniform, you begin to see some impairment, you make them both uniform, and you see exactly what's predicted. Scaling goes on for a little while and then levels off. And it's almost as bad as a pent mutant. But notice, we didn't have to invoke pent at all in the scaling. So in this model, automatic scaling is actually just an emergent property of negative feedback control of the receptors and the co-receptors by the morphogen. But the range over which it occurs is limited. And one of the things that PENT does is it expands that range. So it's not really causing the scaling, but it's regulating it. OK, so let me talk a little bit now about part two, which is this issue of pattern dictating size as opposed to size dictating pattern. And I'll introduce that with a relatively recent 
paper that came out of uh, James Briscoe's group by Anna Kacheva uh, uh, about uh, four years ago. And they were studying a different system. This is the spinal cord of the chick. This is a cross section of the chick's spinal cord, but it may as well be your spinal cord or mine. We have the same structure. At the ventral end, there's something called the floor plate. And during development, it produces a morphogen called sonic hedgehog. And that morphogen creates a gradient. And that gradient is responsible for patterning a whole set of different cell fates going from ventral to dorsal. Actually, there's another gradient from this side that patterns these cell fates. And what uh, Anna Kacheva noticed when carefully looking at these patterning events, if she measured the numbers of cells or the sizes of the compartments that were being patterned, she noted that initially patterning seemed to produce this series of stripes, these domains, in response to different uh, levels and durations of sonic hedgehog exposure. But then, a little bit later in development, the sizes of those domains changed dramatically. Some got much bigger, some got smaller, right? They just seemed to do something that had nothing to do with the original morphogen patterning event. And so she came up with the idea that patterning gives you the domains, but then something autonomous lets each domain based on its identity, whatever transcription factors have been turned on there, it has its own program to achieve a particular size, um, right? So this suggests that at least in this case, pattern comes first and size comes later. So the exact opposite of what we were talking about in the wing disc. So actually there's a lot of evidence in biology for autonomous size control, some really remarkable evidence, some of which goes back to the 1930s with regeneration experiments in which you could transplant the limb bud of a salamander from one salamander to another and it would grow into a limb on that salamander. And if you did a cross-species transplant from a very small salamander onto a big salamander, the limb would grow to the correct size for the small salamander that it came from, not the big salamander that it was grafted onto. And likewise, in the reverse direction, you put a big salamander's limb onto a small salamander, that limb bud grows to the big salamander's size. So the bud seems to know what size it's supposed to grow to, independent of what organism it's attached to. And actually, there's evidence for this sort of autonomy even in people. Right? We all know that there are these growth tables. If you have children, right, they always check where your child is on the growth table to make sure they're following trajectories that are highly predictable. But sometimes if there are injuries or uh, infections and they cause even just a part of the body to fall off the growth table, like you have an injury to the leg and the leg doesn't grow as fast. When the injury heals, everything's recovered, often things grow right back up and catch up. It's called catch up growth. And they catch back up to where they're supposed to be on the original chart. And there are experiments in rats in which just one growth plate, which is the half of the bone that's responsible for bone elongation, just one of these is slowed down with a drug and then that drug is released, is removed later, and the bone catches up to the size it's supposed to be. So each half bone seems to know how much bone to make. We also know that size control is extremely precise because we can take out the brains of mice that are genetically identical, and the coefficient of variation in size or cell number is 3% or so. Or we can go out in the field and get snakes of certain species that have 296 vertebrae, and you can collect a whole bunch of them and find out the coefficient of uh, variation from snake to snake in terms of number of vertebrae is less than 2%, right? So somehow knowing exactly how many of these to make is encoded in the snake's genome. Interestingly, we also know that this kind of size control is not mediated by counting cell cycles or counting time um, because, for example, we can change the, I should, this should say counting time, we can change the rate of the cell cycle in half of a wing disc versus the other, uh, and the wing disc will just grow for a different amount of time until it reaches the right size. We can also change the sizes of the cells 
in one half of the disc versus the other. And then the wing disc will grow fewer cell cycles if you made the cells bigger, or more cell cycles if you made them smaller, in order, again, to evenly match the two sizes of the disc and achieve the size that, a disc, that the wing was originally supposed to be. And we can rule out that cell death is mediating this because you can actually measure cell death during these developmental events. And often it's very, very low, as you can see here. And that actually is the, something that Kacheva also saw in this spinal cord study, is that if you look at proliferation across these different domains as their sizes are changing, it's pretty much the same in all the domains. If you look at death, it's very, very low in all the domains. But if you look at differentiation, if you look at which, the rate at which cells are leaving the cell cycle, that was dramatically different from one domain to the other. And so that was the linchpin, the control point for achieving autonomous size control. And that actually makes sense from first principles thinking. So let, me, let me explain why. So proliferative dynamics, which is a word I use to, to describe the sort of the, the mathematics of cell proliferation, um, is not like the sort of mass action dynamics that most biologists and chemists are used to working with. That's based on kind of these simple linear ODEs, production, destruction, automatically reach a steady state, right, where the concentration is where production and destruction balance. This is the typical thing you would have for gene expression, for an enzyme that makes a product, and so on. But when you have cell proliferation, you have something that makes itself, right? So it's an autocatalytic loop. And even if it's balanced by some death or differentiation at a constant rate, the equation looks like that, which has a non-zero steady state only if these two parameters are exactly equal to each other. Any other parameters, and the thing either vanishes or explodes. Right? So that's a very different thing. This has to be fine-tuned if you want that to reach a steady state. Well, it's even worse than that, because not only would the whole system have to be fine-tuned, every single cell would have to be fine-tuned. Let me explain what I mean by that. Imagine what would happen if it was simply just true on average that the rate of cell division and the rate of cell death was the same. But some cells made two of themselves and some cells made none of themselves and they were balanced, right? What should happen? So if you actually run that as a sort of Monte Carlo simulation, what you see is that the variance, if, there's, you know, any, if, there's, if this is at all probabilistic, the variance expand, expands without bound. And the reason is because due to proliferation, you're compounding your errors. And consequently, upward fluctuations are not balanced by downward fluctuations. And you get a constantly increasing variance. So, the only, so even though you could get a steady state in a deterministic system, if you had perfectly tuned parameters, that's not even good enough in a stochastic system to give you a, a meaningful steady state. Now, of course, this has been known for a long time. Most textbooks draw this picture of how stem cells behave. They say you make one of these and one of those. And if every stem cell did that, that would solve the problem, right? Because there'd be no stochastics. It would be de totally deterministic, right? Unfortunately, this almost never happens. <laughs> Despite the fact that most textbooks draw this, this is extremely rare that you have perfect asymmetric division. Usually you have mixes of symmetric and asymmetric division. So what that tells you is just from first principles, proliferation has to be controlled, and it has to be controlled by a feedback or controlled loop process, or closed loop process. And in fact, that idea has been kicking around since the 1960s, right? And in fact, a word, k-lone, was termed to represent that which was carrying negative feedback from a tissue back onto its own progenitors to stop them from proliferating. And it took until the 1990s to actually validate this hypothesis with the discovery of a molecule called myostatin, or GDF8, which, when mutant, produces an animal that has twice as much muscle as it should have. It's made by muscle, and what it does is inhibits the production of muscle by muscle progenitors. So when you take it away, you get excessive muscle. And after that, then, of course, many molecules were discovered that did similar things in similar tissues. And interestingly, to the biologists at least, about half of them fall into one particular family, the TGF-beta superfamily. Now you might think, okay, problem solved. We have feedback, 
Everything's going to be well controlled. But in fact, it's still not solved because if you take this very simple system of exponential growth and you add represent feedback by simply multiplying it by something that declines with the number of cells. So this would be a typical biologist way of adding negative feedback. You put in a hill function with the thing in the bottom. Okay, so if you do that, what, what would you expect? Should this system now level off at some interesting size? The answer is no, it doesn't even stop growing. It still needs to be perfectly fine-tuned in order to stop. Now, it grows more slowly. It doesn't explode quite as fast. But really, unless you have infinitely steep feedback, uh, you can never get the thing to stop. Now, of course, if you put death in here, you have some significant amount of death, this actually will reach a steady state. Right? You, can, you can see that right away. Right? You can just set the right-hand side equal to the left-hand side. And if the steepness is 1, you can see something like this. This is your steady state as a function of the rate of proliferation. So that works, but there's a problem, which is that this doesn't have any of the robustness properties that you actually see with real autonomous control systems. The amount of stuff you make depends upon the rate of the cell cycle, which we know isn't true. It depends on the initial conditions, which I didn't show you, but it turns out also uh, is, is rarely a factor in determining the size of anything in biology. Um, and furthermore, it requires cell death, whereas many tissues that are especially well-sized controlled are generated without a whole lot of cell death. So the brain, the skeleton, the eye, the wing of the fly, it's primarily controlled simply by proliferation that knows when to stop. Okay, so cell death can't just be thrown in there to explain it. So the reason why you can't get systems to control themselves just by throwing a little feedback term in on the end is because when you have an exponential system, you need something called integral negative feedback. Okay, so to explain integral negative feedback, I usually, uh, if you're an engineer or a control theorist, you don't need to hear this. But if you're anybody else, this is helpful. Um, I give this uh, analogy of what happens when I step on the scale and, you know, I've, I've been to Hong Kong and had too much dim sum and now I have to lose some weight, right? And so I'll set a goal for myself and uh, I'll say I need to lose 10 pounds and I'll go on a diet. What will happen is after I've lost five pounds, I'll relax my diet <laughs> and not do so well anymore. And I've lost another few pounds and I'm not going to diet that much at all because I'm close to my goal. And eventually I'm never actually going to get to my goal because as I get closer to it, the motivation gets less and less. Okay? That's called proportional feedback. The feedback on my behavior is proportional to how far away I am from the goal. And consequently, as I approach the goal, the motivation drops and I never actually reach the goal. So what, what I need to do, or let's say you needed to lose some weight, right? This is what you would want to do. You'd want to ask me to sign a contract with you saying that for every day that you're one pound overweight, you pay me 100 Hong Kong dollars, okay? Per pound, okay, for every day. And you just keep doing that. Well, what's gonna happen? Well, obviously, you're gonna lose all that weight, right? Because otherwise, you're gonna lose all your money to me. Right? Because what's happening is I'm integrating the error. The difference between where you want to be and where you're going to be, you keep paying me money every single day that you're not at your goal. And the motivation grows, because right? you're getting poorer and poorer, and you want to right, save that, uh, that money. So the difference with integral feedback is the motivation is proportional to how long you're not at your goal, as opposed to how far away you are from your goal. And that ensures that the goal is always reached. Okay, so that's the basis of integral feedback. And it turns out there are four mechanisms, well, three mechanisms that have been described uh, and explained in biology for integral negative feedback controller growth. One it has to do with mechanics, and it was identified by Boris Schreiman, a physicist, a number of years ago, that if cells are squeezed, they stop growing, and if they're stretched, they grow faster. Okay, and that's well known now, and it's thought to have to do with the YAP-TAS pathway and HIPPO signaling and so on. But the point is, if that's the case, then if cells in a small region start overgrowing, the pressure builds up, and it will keep building up as long as their growth rate is different from the growth rate of the cells around them. 
And so consequently, their motivation, that is the negative feedback, gets stronger and stronger and stronger until their growth rate matches that of what's around them. So that's one mechanism. That's not a great mechanism for autonomous control of growth because it doesn't give you to any one particular size. It just means that you're even, whatever you do. Cells never do much different from their neighbors. Okay. Second mechanism, classic one in ecology, is logistic growth. You run out of food, you stop growing. Okay. That actually is integral negative feedback because your starvation is integrating your growth, essentially. So that's great if you're seals in the you know, environment. Um, you can stop growing when you run out of fish to eat. But in terms of tissue growth, that's not very realistic because tissues are fed by, all by the same bloodstream. And if one tissue overgrows, that really doesn't deplete the resources that have to feed all these other tissues as well. So tissues really aren't limited. And in fact, we know this in cancer biology, right? You get a tumor, the tumor just calls in all the nutrients it needs by calling in blood vessels. Right? There doesn't seem to be a limitation there. So that's probably not very realistic. The mechanism that I will talk about is this thing called renewal control, which is based on the idea that you have cell lineages, and so therefore cells can differentiate. And you have negative feedback occurring in these cell lineages, but not negative feedback on the rate of the cell cycle, which I have represented by V here, but negative feedback on this thing I'm calling P here, which stands for the probability of renewal. So every time cells are in a lineage, they can either renew or progress. And so you need some parameter to capture what's the probability that they will renew or progress. If P is 0.5, it means half the time they renew and half the time they progress. Right? If P is zero, it means they always progress. If P is one, it means they just double. Okay, and then there's probably another mechanism that we don't know about, but I don't have time to talk about it yet. Okay, so what's so great about this feeding back on renewal thing? So consider that you have a two-stage lineage of cells this way. What's nice about this, at least if you think about this deterministically, is you can write it in terms of very simple differential equations, right? That the number of stem cells goes up according to the number of stem cells. Well, that makes sense, right? Autocatalytic. But now you have to put in this P here. So 2P means... Um, with probability P, they double, and then you remove one stem cell. That's the mother that gave rise to the two daughters, right? And then for the terminal cells, it's two times one minus P. And then if you'd like, you can let the terminal cells die so that you have some sort of steady state that could be reached here. As you'll see later, we can get rid of this and also get an interesting system. So to now uh, represent feedback, all we have to do is make this P thing some kind of declining function of the number of terminal cells. And it really doesn't matter what declining function, but we're going to put in this one for now. So if you do that and you say, okay, well, how does that differential equation behave if you initiate it from a condition of a few of these and none of those? And you see that the stem cells rise and then fall, and then the terminal cells rise, and they rise up to some steady level. They do that very, very fast. It's almost an exponential approach. And if you have twofold fewer starting cells, twofold lower death, twofold faster cell cycle, any variations to those parameters, nothing happens to the steady state. So it's always stable regardless of the parameters. There's no need to care how the cells divide symmetrically, asymmetrically. It doesn't make a difference. It's almost perfectly exponential in speed and it has what's called perfect robustness, meaning that many of the parameters drop out. Okay? And that's a characteristic of integral feedback, as you get perfect robustness, because you reach a goal that depends only on what's inside the feedback loop and not the rest of the system. And of course, you can see why it has perfect robustness, because you can take that first equation. You can say as long as C0 isn't zero, then the only way you can have a steady state is P is one half. And if P is defined by that, the only way it can be one half is if C has that value, and that value doesn't depend on all the other parameters or the initial conditions. So interestingly, you can also take away that death term. And so now you have an even simpler system. A couple differential equations here. Now, of course, C goes to zero as time goes to infinity. You actually use up all the stem cells and they turn into terminal cells. So you can't just find the steady state by setting the rates to zero because you have zero equals zero. 
So what you have to do instead is you have to merge your two differential equations into one by defining the total size of the system equals C0 plus C1. So then its rate of change is the sum of these two rates of change. So you sum those two equations, you get that S prime is just equal to VC0. Right now you integrate that, right? And you use the second differential equation to solve for C0. And so now you get a differential equation for size, which depends only on C1. But you'll notice, so first of all, you can cancel the Vs. Right away you see rate of the cell cycle independent. But you also notice that C1 appears with its own derivative. So you can change that, right, into just being the integral of the form of the feedback, where the limits of integration are just the initial and the final conditions on C1. But of course, the final condition on C1 is the same thing as the total system size, because the stem cells all go away. And so in the end, you get this equation for the size of the system that involves the size of the system on both sides, so it's implicit. And if you put in, say, that Hill function form for P0, you actually get an integral you can evaluate. And you get this, which is a lot uglier, but in fact, oops, in fact shows you the same thing, which is that the initial conditions are there, but they're as long as um, the final size is large, they're negligible. And so essentially you have the same properties that you saw in the system with, uh, with cell death, that it forms a number of cells that's almost completely robust to, to essentially parameters, disturbances, differences in the initial condition. And the stem cells go to zero. Now in order to show that this isn't real, really just fantasy, you can actually um, look at data from the brain, which recall is something that forms a final size with very high precision. And you can see that the self-renewal probabilities have actually been measured in the cerebral cortex over time. And they have exactly the same sort of form, a very, very rapid decline as the organ is growing uh, that this predicts. You also get catch-up growth from these equations, this very, very exponential sort of kinetics that engineers call bang-bang kinetics, where it goes as fast as possible to the goal and then essentially levels off. And you get systems that can regenerate. So halfway in, you can get rid of the differentiated cells and they'll just come right back. So all these properties just come out of a couple of very simple differential equations. And you also completely suppress all these stochastic fluctuations because now the cells essentially are using this feedback um, to, constant, to keep pushing themselves back towards the median or the mean. So of course it turns out now that whenever K loans have been examined, they in fact do feedback on renewal, um, not just on the rate of the cell cycle, but on the probability of progression. So whenever you see something changing the proportions of things in a lineage or changing the final number of cells you get at the end, don't look for something that affects the rate of the cell cycle because it's not going to do anything. You have to be looking for something that affects the probability of renewal. Now, as with all engineering strategies, there are Achilles heels or limitations. And it turns out that renewal control is very prone to being thrown into oscillations, and there are tricks that biological systems can do to deal with that. Using feedback to coordinate an entire group of cells makes them very prone to cheaters. That is, any cell that wants to be less sensitive to feedback will very quickly take over a population, um, and that would make us much more prone to things like cancer than we, we are. And so that's another thing that, that uh, again, there are tricks that the system can use to get around that. But the thing I want to end up talking about is this idea of spatial limitations, because that connects with the first part of my talk. And that's that up until now, I've been discussing all this as though these systems can be described with ODEs, right? No space involved, just the cells are exchanging some factor. But in fact, signals decay over space. And as things get bigger, Right? Decay has to be taken into account. Right? As we already know, when diffusible molecules spread, but are taken up at the same time, right, there's a characteristic number, that intrinsic decay length, that quantifies how far molecules get before they get destroyed. So if you model 
what happens to a group of cells as it grows bigger and bigger, and you model the concentration of anything those cells make and secrete into their environment, it will eventually always level off once the group of cells hits that characteristic decay length. Consequently, when it levels off, as the thing gets bigger, the amount of feedback does not go up anymore, right? So essentially, what you have is that cells go up, but the feedback doesn't. And you have what's called a declining gain feedback problem, that the sensitivity of this P to the size of the tissue is great when the tissue's small, but it's terrible when the tissue's large. When the tissue's large, all that the tissue can sense is the proportions of cells that are differentiated or non-differentiated. It can't actually count the number up. So that's a problem because I told you that when you can sense the number of cells, you get a beautiful, perfectly stable, highly robust system. But if you can only sense the proportion of cells, you actually get a system that's categorically unstable. For all parameters, it explodes. Okay, so that's very bad, right? Even worse, for most of usable signals, this characteristic length is on the order of 70 microns, right? How in the world do you make one of these that's a meter long with signals that only spread 70 microns? Okay, so that's an interesting question. So it turns out the problem's not as bad as it seems because the tissue does not need to maintain itself at a steady state. It simply needs to reach a final state. So if you have final state systems, systems that essentially use up all their stem cells, they can actually go beyond that lambda, that characteristic decay length, because essentially what's happening is the stem cell number is dropping and dropping, and eventually you get a point of no return where you're going to lose them anyway, even if you do get to a point where you can no longer measure your own feedback. Let me just show you that. If you model that, you have to, of course, put in some boundary conditions now, you have to model the advection and the diffusion, but basically you can see that as time goes on, the number of cells goes up and they turn from stem, which is red, to terminal, which is black, and they level off. And then here's a different initial condition, leveling off at about the same size. And this size is several fold times the characteristic decay length, right? And this works because basically you're controlling things up to about here, and then you're letting go of control, but it's okay. You're going to finish anyway. And you can do a complete sweep of parameter space, and you can say, well, you can get up to about 20, 30 times the, final, the, the size of the decay length, but then you stop getting this insensitivity to initial size. Now you become what's called fragile. Now you depend heavily on your parameters. So you can't keep pushing this system to try to get too big, because if you lower that feedback gain too much, eventually it will explode. So it has a bifurcation in here, where you can get a little bit better than that one lambda, and you can get out to 10 or 20 lambdas, but you can't get out to one meter, right? Maybe you can get to a couple millimeters. Okay, so we just have to get from a couple millimeters to a meter now, right? So how do we do that? Well, one way is to divide up the problem into littler problems. One of the things we know is that in an arm, the size is controlled by the bones. The bones are controlled by the chondrocytes that are formed at the growth plate. The chondrocytes know which direction is proximal and distal, and they grow 20-fold in volume, but they grow asymmetrically so that they expand six-fold in height. And consequently, that stretches everything out six-fold. So now we've got another factor of six thrown in there. That gets us to 10 millimeters. But then we also know the arm is patterned, and it's patterned very early, and it's subdivided into a, one part, another part, and another whole bunch of parts there. And each part has a growth plate on either end. And each growth plate is the source of autonomous growth control. So we just have to control each one of them separately. This is exactly the same as that Kitchever problem in the spinal cord. We divided it up into parts, and then we let each part autonomously growth control. And so now we can get down to about 100 millimeters. Okay, so, okay, we're almost there. Right? We've got another order of magnitude to go. So where do we get that one from? So this is our best guess, and it involves exactly what engineers do when they encounter declining gain feedback problems. They use what's called internal models. The best example of that that 
um, I can uh, use to illustrate it actually comes from neuroscience. It's the mechanism by which a baseball player can catch a baseball. Okay, you may think it's easy, right? You just practice, you get good at it, you can catch a baseball. The problem is the way you catch a baseball is you use a feedback system, right? You have uh, sensors in your muscles and joints that tell you where they are, and you have vision that tells you where the ball is, and you're using feedback from your muscles to control the messages to your muscles. And that's great when the ball is very far away, but the problem is it takes time for the messages to go up and down the axons. And consequently, the delay gets really uh, insufferable when the ball is about halfway to you. Okay? At that point, feedback is useless. You can't get it to you fast enough. So what happens is your spinal cord creates a little model of the scene. The ball, the arm, the muscles, it's all there modeled in your spinal cord. The controls that go to your muscle go to the spinal cord, and then the spinal cord generates a model of what your muscles must be telling it, except there's no delay now because it's all happening very, very locally. And so consequently, the signals come from this internal model, and that deals with the fact that the, that the, the original feedback has gotten too far away, too hard to access. And so you can imagine the same thing. I've told you when tissues get too big, this gets too weak. Well, you could just have the tissues make a cell over here that's an internal model cell, but not so many of them. Maybe for every hundred of these, make one or two of those. And have this one do the feedback. And of course, this one, because there's just a few of them, they don't worry about that size issue, but you would make the number of these that's determined by the number of those. Okay, now you can do a few other tricks, like put a little feedback here to make sure these guys don't mix so that these guys keep moving out while these stay local. You can have these guys slowly go back into the stem cell pool so they eventually disappear. And if you model that, again, with differential equations, now you can get up to tens or hundreds of lambda, right? You can get several orders of magnitude if you want, although there are some prices you pay for that where you see that the stem cells go down, the internal model cells go up, the internal model cells go down, and eventually you get a very robust number of terminal cells. Is this the way it's actually done in the bone? Well, we don't know for sure, but there's some very interesting things about the way bone works, or the way the, the chondrocyte, chondrogenesis in the growth plate works, that looks just like that model. So one thing is we know that the proliferating cells produce differentiated cells which exert negative feedback on the renewal probability of those. That's known. We also know there's another cell type over here that's called the resting zone cell. Nobody knows much about it except that it eventually goes into this pool. And the usual thing people say is, well, you need extra stem cells in case you run out of them. And mathematically, that's ridiculous. The stem cells are self-renewing. There's no danger of running out of them, right? They can double themselves in one cell cycle. So these things have to be there for some other reason. And we know that they're also, early in development, not there. They're made by these guys. And we also know that they, too, feedback and inhibit the self-renewal of these cells. So it looks exactly like that internal model picture that I drew you before. But again, it's just a speculation right now as to whether that's really what's going on in the bone. OK, so basically, the exploitation of feedback control in the context of cell lineages gives you these strategies for robust autonomous control of growth and size. And if you put these downstream of pattern formation, you can get even very large final state tissues, not steady state tissues, but final state tissues where things are specified with high precision. So of course, many, many puzzles still remain about scale and pattern. We really don't know what most of the feedback signals are um, in development. We don't know if patterning and growth are integrated in other ways besides the ones I told you about. Um, probably they are. We don't really know how the sizes of large steady state tissues are maintained. So you don't have many of them, but you have a few. One of them is your skin. Have you ever wondered why you have the amount of skin you have? Why don't you have twice as much skin? Why don't you look like that dog, the Sharpe, right, that has the extra folds of skin? Right? How does the skin know to stop growing at this size? It's not just mechanical tension, 
because there are regions of skin under very little mechanical tension, and they still know to produce the right size. So this remains a, a mystery. We don't really know what evolution is tweaking in order to change each of these compartment sizes, but we know this is one of the main things that distinguishes among species. And finally, we don't know the relationship between these strategies and what are the disorders of morphogenesis, essentially structural birth defects, where this uh, appropriate control of size and, and pattern and their coupling is disrupted. So I'll just stop there and acknowledge the folks who've been involved in uh, a lot of the work I talked about, uh, particularly people in my lab. Uh, uh, let me uh, point out Jimmy Zhu, who um, did all that beautiful work on, on Pentagon and scaling in wing disks, and Samir and Kuncha and Peng Zhang uh, involved in, in growth control. And here are some of our collaborators, including uh, two wonderful mathematicians at UCI, Ching Nie and John Lohengrub. And uh, I'll thank you for your attention and happy to answer your questions. <laughs> no, if the pattern is autonomous, right, you would probably get a very big fetus inside a small elephant and it would not be good. Um, but uh, I don't know actually if that's, yeah, it sounds like basically that's what I was going to say. Is you, you would deal with that surgically <laughs> rather than trying to affect the genome. <laughs> I think there may be other problems with, um, you know, particularly with mammals, right, the development Intrauterine development involves a placenta, which is a chimeric organ that's partly fetus and partly mother. And a cross-species placenta may or may not work. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. And since no one's ever tried this with a mammoth, we have no idea whether, whether it's even feasible. Yeah. But it's interesting. I think from a genome standpoint, it would be very interesting to understand what in the mammoth genome is responsible for its much larger size, right? Yeah. I mean, the traditional view is to look towards growth factors, you know, things like that. But I think what uh, some of the things I talked about suggest is you, what you really should be looking for is the negative regulators of growth, and you know, to see either different sensitivities or different production rates of negative regulators. Maybe the gene uh, just uh, regulate the P. Right, exactly, exactly. And you know, we have some ideas what are the what are the, the pathways that are most closely connected to regulating the self renewal probability. Other questions? So I was kind of curious about how those kind of uh, inhibitor chemicals and uh, those kind of amorphous chemicals that actually plays a role in those kind of... But it seems like what you're saying right now is that those two, this is sounds like playing a role in determining the pattern and size formation. Am I understanding it right? Yes. So, so, but in any tuning model, it sounds like those kind of things that had a role. So, can you comment on this kind of like contradiction or inconsistency? Yeah. Well, I don't think there's any inconsistency. Really, I, 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 I wish I had more time because it would have been fun to talk more about Turing patterning. So, I mean, Turing patterning is an example of self-organizing pattern that was described even before you know, this sort of model of weapon range morphogen gradients and positional information. And Turing patterning also involves 
diffusible factors, which can be exactly the same molecules that are producing these long-range morphogy gradients. So for example, we now generally biologists accept that things like our hair follicles, the papillae on our tongue, the feathers on birds, the stripes on zebra, that all of these are true Turing patterns. Um, and they're mediated by sonic hedgehog, BMPs, uh, WINTS, all the same uh, morphogens that are doing this long-range patterning as well. But Turing patterning is an example of true self-organizing pattern. That is to say, these molecules themselves adopt the pattern, whereas long-range morphogen-mediated patterning is really just an example of uh, giving cells their positional values and let the, rest, let the genome do the rest of the work. So they're very different in that way. Now, Turing patterns, one of the reasons why biologists early on moved away from the idea of Turing patterning is in part because Turing patterns don't scale very well. Right? In order to scale a Turing pattern, you have to postulate some other factor, rather like the expander that goes in everywhere and sort of changes the parameter ranges of the Turing pattern. And you know, people, people thought that that was implausible. I think now people don't think that's so implausible. But uh, there are not really great examples of scaling Turing patterns that I know of. What seems to happen more often is a Turing pattern, so for like your hairs, those are established by a Turing pattern that occurs early in development when the hairs are very close together on the right scale to match the wavelength you would predict for these kinds of molecules making Turing pattern. But then, once you've established the hair follicle, well then the skin grows. Everything grows autonomously and things now become spread out over distances that say differ greatly between an elephant and a mouse. Right? Even though at the time of embryogenesis when they're forming, all the distances are the same. Maybe I'll just ask one more. Sure. So I, I was kind of also curious that in, in your model, it seems like there is not quite description on how environment is affecting the, the, this kind of growth, this kind of interaction. Am I getting it right yet? Well, I didn't say anything about environment. That's true. Um, and, you know, as a developmental biologist, you simultaneously want to study why some of these processes are resistant to the environment, right? And so I talked a lot about robustness and how things are, say, robust to the rate of the cell cycle. It's actually very important, particularly for cold-blooded organisms, where the rate of the cell cycle is tremendously affected by temperature, right? But on the other hand, it's also true that environment does affect pattern and scale, particularly in the cold-blooded organisms where when you grow insects at cold temperatures, you actually get large insects, right? And some of that is because the cells themselves are larger, so cells also have autonomous size control. That's something I didn't talk about. But some of it also is probably because the parameters within the feedback loops are themselves temperature sensitive. So one of the nice things about integral feedback control is you can sort of divide the world up into what's inside the loop and everything else. Now, if you have a good integral controller, then everything is determined by what's inside the loop, and everything else is irrelevant, right? So you can adjust things, but you have to adjust them there. You can argue that that makes good sense, certainly in terms of evolvability, right? Now you can evolve to different sizes because all of the control is aggregated in one place. Right? But then you can make the counter argument that, oh, that makes it very easy to break this and, you know, have a cancer. So now, you know, Engineering is always like that. Every solution creates a new problem. So, uh, no question like sex the speaker. We come back in 15 minutes.